like to introduce the uh, Director of Cardiac Anesthesia at UT Herman, um, who we share our uh, fellows with, um, Dr. Roy Scheinbaum. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many are anesthesia fellows here and surgical types? So you're out, out, outnumbered for a change. Okay. So uh, my talk here is about the considerations, and I guess I could label it anesthesia considerations, but it's actually both anesthesia and surgical considerations for thoracoabdominal aneurysm repair. And I'm really going to talk about the open repairs and not the, uh, the, 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 the T-VARs, which uh, are making uh, inroads into this uh, operation, uh, unfortunately, well, fortunately, I guess, for the patients. Um, but um, obviously, I can't talk about everything in, in the time allotted, so I'll try and go over, I think, the highlights that... Uh, over the past uh, couple of decades uh, we've been involved with and hopefully will keep you guys out of trouble when you do these cases. Uh, it's important to know what the risk factors are, the classification of these things. Oops, I think we missed some stuff here. Uh, okay. Uh, risk factors, these patients are at very high risk, uh, bottom line. And unlike uh, other types of surgeries where you're actually doing the surgery to improve patient's physiology and function, you're not actually going to improve, improve physiology or function of the of the cardiac system, the lung, pulmonary system, the, the kidneys, uh, the hematopoietic system, et cetera. So you're starting off with a, a lump of coal, and you're going to end up with a lump of, a lump of coal, but with uh, hopefully uh, better plumbing, better vasculature. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind, that you're not going to make these patients better uh, post-procedure uh, at all. And because of that, and because the underlying comorbidities, these patients, I think, uh, are some of the most uh, complex ones that we deal with. The classification of aneurysms, uh, I think, is very important. The extent of aneurysm really determines the amount of ischemia that patients uh, encounter. Uh, also, the, the, the greater the extent, the more sewing. More sewing equals more bleeding, more ischemia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and you get the vicious circle. So these, these are important things to know. So if it's so horrific, why bother doing it? And then when do you do it? Well, if you don't do it, if you just leave these patients alone, uh, they die relatively quickly. If you do treat these patients and replace their orders, then they actually have a chance at survival. Uh, what happens if we just uh, wait, wait it out? Um, well, by size, uh, usually the criterion for operating are anything over five centimeters. Uh, once patients get above five centimeters, the risk of rupture tends to get a lot higher. Now, that doesn't mean that patients at five centimeters will rupture, they just have a higher risk of rupture. And we've also seen patients with, with the aortas in the four, 4.2 centimeter range, who rupture spontaneously. So there's no safe zone, just sort of relative risk. Uh, and the relative risk is important because you want to get these patients before they actually rupture. If someone comes in with a rupture, uh, it's a disaster. So you want to do them electively if possible. And then these are just the criteria for when to operate. So the things that become important, how do we protect things? Let's start with the heart, because I think that's uh, one of the number one things we have to deal with. Any surgeon worth his salt loves to put a clamp on a large vessel. That's bottom line. You guys are born for that. That's, that's what it is. Uh, we, on the other hand, the patients, <clears throat> well, that's not so good. Uh, why is it not so good? Uh, simple things, because it can really destroy the, the left ventricle, cause a whole bunch of problems, basically ischemia, AI, all, all sorts of nastiness. So we have to look at ways of, of, of dealing with that uh, and prevent the uh, myocardial death that's, that's caused by a cross clamp. We have several things we can do, uh, pharmacologic and mechanical support. Let's talk about some of the pharmacology initially. Uh, back in the old days, when I was first sort of in your shoes, we had uh, two main drugs, sodium nitroprusside, which is a relic. It's like a dodo bird. I don't think anyone in their right mind uses it these days for good reasons. And nitroglycerin, which is also kind of a relic, uh, which uh, we don't use anymore because of basically side effects, tachyphylaxis, tachycardia, and all the things that you really don't want it to do. Instead, we use dihydropyridones, uh, i.e., which is nicardipine, uh, which is, I think, probably the best vasodilator we have. doesn't have any cardiac effects, nice smooth onset of action, et cetera, et cetera. There's a new agent now, which is a bit shorter acting uh, than that, but um, essentially it's the same drug, just a shorter half-life. Mechanical support, this has really become more of a mainstay in, in, in treatment of, uh, of, of the hemodynamic changes in thoracobdominal angiogram repair. Uh, initially started off with a GOT shunt, which is the passive shunt, uh, which was used, which was okay, but the active shunts are better for several reasons. They allow for uh, temperature control, uh, flow control of how much distal aortic perfusion one's providing. You can warm, you can cool the patient up, uh, et, et cetera. So what happens when the patients uh, 
are, hypo, are a bit hypotensive when you do these procedures. Uh, well, the number one thing is uh, volume. Volume, 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 volume. If you don't know what's going on, give some volume. Okay, this is an operation with a, where essentially you're losing a lot of volume if you haven't gotten that, that thing. You also have to look at other things like the electrolytes. Uh, we use uh, a lot of citrate in the cell saver. We don't want to give too much heparin to these patients. We end up using uh, citrate in our cell saver. Citrate uh, will, cal will chelate out the calcium. If your ionized calciums are low, it's going to have a negative impact on your vascular tone and myocardial function. So you want to do frequent analysis of your ionized calcium levels. You need to look at your acid base. These patients are ischemic. There's a lot of uh, lactic acid being produced. And if you're not uh, cognizant of your acid base status, then uh, that's going to have a negative impact on myocardial function. So often you'll have a bicarb drip running to, to mop up the excess lactate that's being produced. Your pump flows, it's very important to have communication between the anesthesiologist and the perfusionist, all right? Your pressures go down, then uh, you have to back off on your pump flows, let the heart fill up a bit. Uh, your pressures go up, you can increase your pump flows. Remember, uh, you're measuring the pressure in the right radial artery. When the pressures are up uh, and you increase the pump flows, the, the pump is a preload reducer, so you're actually taking blood out of the heart and putting it distally, which will lower your blood pressure. The opposite happens when your blood pressure is low, so you have to coordinate very carefully with, with your perfusions. We like to have the pump flows running between sort of one and a half to two liters max. Pressors are your last resort. Um, how do you, you know, assess your volume status? Well, you're not really going to be able to look at the heart because you really, you're not going to see the heart visually, so you have to look at your other tools. We all put in CVPs. We have PA pressures, uh, PA catheters, and so you can look at that. Uh, echo, I, uh, you know, I know this is a, a strong echo talk. Uh, I think echo just gets in the way with thoracoabdominal abdominal aneurysm. So another piece of equipment that people look at instead of looking at the patient, the hemodynamics, and you're struggling. Is this heart full? Is this heart empty? I don't know, what, you know what's going on. Well, if you need an echo to tell you that you're hypovolemic, uh, go back to CA1, please. Okay. Uh, so in order to, <laughs> to take care of some of this, uh, what do we need to do? Well, we need to have an adequate way of putting in, of, of getting volume into these patients. And... Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with it, double IJ sticks are pretty common now. You can see this is a little bit older picture because of my uh, excellent uh, use of sterility technique here. Uh, but this is what we used to do, and it works, works quite well. So the, it doesn't matter whether you put the triple lumen above or below the cortis. It, it's, it's nonsensical making that argument. They can go anywhere. Uh, it's, it's really not a big deal. So we like to use the two, the, the two IJ lines. Uh, but you can go subclavian, you can go superclav, you can do the other side. The right side is just usually the easy one to do and, and, and to use. Arterial access, uh, we just use a single line, uh, usually in the right radial. You don't need, you're going to lose femorals when you put the clamp on. You don't really need the left sided because sometimes if the clamp's super high, you're going to knock off your subclavian anyway. So the right radial is really, is really the key for us and, and it does everything you need to do. Uh, as far as the... Um, as far as the lungs are concerned, let's just say you want to isolate the lungs. It doesn't matter how you do it, whether you use blockers or double lumen tubes or not. Uh, but you want to have the lung isolated. Why? Well, the surgeon's going to be very thankful that they can actually see what they're supposed to see. And you'll be thankful that uh, they're not using one of those lung beater baskets to retract the lung away. Remember, you are going to give some heparin to these patients because you're on partial bypass. And uh, any time you push the lung that's partially heparinized, that lung is going to start looking like a liver, it's going to start bleeding, and it's going to lead to all sorts of problems. So make sure, take your time to make sure you have adequate and proper lung isolation. I think it's key for the surgeon. Other big risk problem, kidneys. The kidneys are going to get you into more problem with these cases than you realize. If not immediately intraoperatively, then certainly postoperatively. And the problem is that for various reasons, um, some unknown and some known, there's a high incidence of renal dysfunction uh, in these types of procedures, especially the extent twos. Uh, and that doesn't matter whether you do uh, renal replacement therapy dialysis or not, uh, you're going to have uh, issues with, uh, with renal failure. And if patients develop acute renal failure, there's about a 50% mortality rate associated with, associated with it. So you want to look at ways of protecting the kidney. One of the things to do is also to look at their preoperative function, and I think we have to look at GFR and not creatinine. The reason why looking at GFR and not creatinine is because of this area here where you may have a normal creat uh, G uh, creatinine value, but your GFR is actually abnormal. So GFR is key. And for those of you 
interested in GFRs. This is sort of everywhere to be seen. You can memorize it. You probably should uh, and, 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 and utilize it. Uh, this graph just illustrates the uh, impact renal failure or renal dysfunction has on mortality. Uh, that as you go in the lower quartiles of GFR, your mortality increases significantly. Renal dysfunction is also a big predictor for overall long-term mortality as well, uh, even more so than extent of aneurysm, believe it or not. There are various strategies which we've tried to employ to uh, decrease uh, the incidence of renal dysfunction in these, in these patients. Mantol, lip diuretics, dopaminergic act, uh, uh, agents such as phenoldepam, et cetera, uh, renal plegia. Suffice to say, they work a little bit, but they don't work as well as they should, uh, and renal dysfunction is still a major problem. So what else happens to these patients? Spinal cord, this is a biggie. This is something we've actually done a lot of work with uh, and have had some, some much better outcomes uh, with, with various modalities. So why is that a problem? Well, it's devastating to income, it, uh, to outcome. It actually negatively impacts uh, the morbidity and mortality, and it's also devastating to those who survive. Uh, patients without neurologic deficits live a lot longer than those who do have neurologic deficits. Um, again, ex just reiterating that the extent of the aneurysm has a major impact on, on things, and especially uh, uh, spinal cord uh, neurologic deficit stuff. So in the old era, when surgeons just used to like to clamp and go, these are the, sort of the numbers for, for paraplegia. Uh, the extent to is up to 30 percent, pretty high. Why is it like that? Well, the, the what the, the motor supply, the anterior part of the cord, is a very precarious blood supply. Uh, the artery of Demkowitz anywhere from a sort of L T8 to L1 or 2. Uh, you don't really know exactly where it is, but it's very precarious, and this obviously gets uh, disturbed uh, during the process of uh, clamping the, the aorta, um, and uh, that becomes a problem. So what do we do to try and, and circumvent some of these issues? We use this aortic perfusion. We try and get the distal aortic perfusion pressures up between sort of 70 to 80. Uh, we use mild cooling with the pump, mild cooling being about 34 degrees. You start getting much cooler than that, and you start running the risk of coagulation problems, um, dysrhythmias when you get too cold, fibrillation when you get really cold. <clears throat> That's not so good. We use neuromonitoring, both motor uh, and uh, somatosensory evoke potentials, and CSF drainage. Uh, neuromonitoring, uh, we look at both sensory, which is posterior, and uh, motor, which is anterior cord. Uh, we're actually stimulating, uh, stimulating the brain. What we look for are two things, latency, so a change in latency, which is a 10% change in latency, and a 50% decrease in amplitude are considered positive changes. If you see that, uh, and this is obviously a uh, much more marked representation. If you see that, then, then things are bad and you have to work fast. You have to re the surgeon has to work at re-implanting uh, as many of the collateral vessels as they see uh, available. Um, and then we have to do, make, do maneuvers to try and get the blood pressure up, make sure the hemoglobin gets a little higher, and drain some CSF. Uh, fortunately, uh, sometimes when you use uh, motor evoked potentials, you see no changes at all. You know when you see no changes, that patient's going to wake up, they're going to move, everything's going to be fine. So that takes care of immediate uh, paralysis. There's another entity called delayed paraplegia. Uh, that happens, we think, because of postoperative edema around the spinal cord, and that's also where CSF drainage comes into play. I think Dr. Athanasia is going to show you some of this stuff, so we'll do away with the kit. Suffice to say, you put the lumbar drain in. Uh, we prefer to do it below L2, because uh, at L4, L5, because the cord usually ends up around L2 and you don't want to puncture the cord. Uh, that has some major problems. We can talk about stuff about what do you do with spinal hardware, but suffice to say that uh, you can certainly put uh, drains in even though someone's had laminectomies and stuff, and we've done multiple of those without any problems, fortunately. Uh, this is just a drain going in in real time. Big needle, find the spot. Again, notice the aseptic technique. Um, fluid comes out, catheter goes in, um, and you know, you're done. It's really fairly simple, fortunately, most of the time. We try and drain to a level of, uh, of sort of 10 to 15. Uh, this is what happens uh, if you have neurologic deficit and the drain's in place and you do drain, you actually get about two-thirds of those patients recover. Uh, if you don't have a drain in place, none of them recover and you have a major problem. You have to be careful about how much you drain. If you drain too much, you can cause subarachnoid hemorrhage which is associated with like a 70 or 80% chance of death, so be careful about that. 
Uh, these are the results for using adjuncts, uh, before adjuncts and after adjuncts, and you can see that the paraplegia rate uh, has decreased substantially. A quick sort of one minute, because I know I'm running a bit over, about coagulation. A lot's been made about coagulation. These cases uh, can bleed quite a bit. There's a lot of blood turnover, and you have to be careful about uh, uh, staying on top of things. Uh, to me, coagulation, unlike Dr. Levy, it's, it's very simple. I need glue, and I need substrate for that glue to hold on to. So glue is fibrinogen, uh, fibrin. How do I get it? I can give it through various modes, and the stuff that the glue actually works on are platelets, <coughs> and there's only sort of one way to get platelets. Um, we cause lots of perturbations in coagulation system, both iatrogenically during these cases, and we have to be able to reverse the problems that we have. Uh, so these are all the things we can give. Uh, you can't just throw everything under the sun at the patient because there's tons of literature out there supporting that the more blood products you give, the worse off patients get. So you have to be selective in what you do. And I think these days we're more uh, attuned to some of the uh, uh, factor concentrates that I think are very useful in these procedures, uh, especially when you have cell silver turnover that's pretty high. So it's not uncommon in an extent two uh, to have um, two or three or more blood volumes of the patients going through through a cell saver. So you can easily have uh, 10, 15, 25 you know, liters of patient blood going through a cell saver. And when you get that kind of cell saver turnover, your fibrinogen levels are very low. Your platelet function is like non-existent, so you have to be proactive with that type of stuff. We use point-of-care monitoring for this, uh, fibrinogen levels, TEG, et cetera, and we try and correct things as quickly as possible. Normal tag, uh, you can see the pre-op tag there is the white, the sort of pinkish one is what happened uh, after everything was done and the patient was bleeding, and then the green one is after we gave uh, product replacement therapy. Um, I'd like to ask our, our fellows sort of what the concentration of of fibrinogen is in various products. So here's a cheat sheet for you. Uh, just realize that cryoprecipitate has a hell of a lot more fibrinogen than plasma does, um, but uh, that some of the factor concentrate is even more. The problem being with factor concentrates, you don't have any of the other, any of the other factors uh, with you. So I think that's where something like uh, 27910 um, is useful. And we like to use the four factor uh, concentrates, not the three factor concentrates. Hopefully this is what you sort of end up with, a nice uh, Hollywood picture. <clears throat> Notice there's no blood on the, on the green sheets. The surgeon did an amazing job. Uh, we may have helped a little bit with that, uh, and that's what you're really looking for. And that's about it. Uh, thoric abdominals, I think there's open ones. They're still some of the most challenging things we do. They're the most fun things we do. There's a lot of work that can go into uh, improving these things. Uh, and I think if you know how to do a thoric abdominal aneurysm, you can probably handle uh, some of the other stuff that comes your way. And uh, with that, I'm, I, I thank you very much. <laughs>